Okay, so welcome everyone to our entrepreneurship panel. My name is Tashlyn Teske and I'm the manager of projects and research with Workforce Windsor Essex and I'm excited to be facilitating uh, this session this afternoon. So Workforce Windsor Essex is a workforce and community development board whose mission is to lead regional employment and community planning for the development of a strong and sustainable workforce. Uh, to learn more about what we do and how we can help you, please visit WorkforceWindsorEssex.com. So while this event is virtual, we would like to respectfully acknowledge that the land on which we gather today is the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi peoples. We're grateful to work, learn, and live in this area. Today's event is all about learning what entrepreneurship is, what does it look like to own your own business, and how it can be a sustainable career in Windsor, Essex. Our goal is to celebrate local entrepreneurs using their stories as learning opportunities. After the event, make sure to check out our new entrepreneurship portal at workforcewindsoressex.com slash entrepreneurship dash in dash Windsor Essex. Um, now, just for a few housekeeping items uh, to be considered sorry, to be considered and accommodate everyone today, we're doing things a bit differently by doing a Zoom webinar. So while you might not be able to see all of the attendees, you will have opportunity to engage with our guests during the Q&A sessions. So please feel free to use the chat feature located at the bottom of your video window to engage with our attendees, as well as you can submit questions at any time throughout the session using the Q&A box uh, located in the bottom as well. You can also upvote any questions you want answered. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, just please send a message in the chat box and we'll be able to help you out hopefully. Um, so you would have noticed at the beginning, uh, we are recording this session. So a video file um, and any really sorry, relevant links will be available on Workforce Windsor Essex's YouTube channel, and we're also streaming um, the video afterwards on Facebook. So now I would like to welcome our speakers today. Um, so we have Sean Das, Mylene Tu, Emily Johnson, and J.D. Tarbett. So Sean Das, co-founder of Dyerberg Transformation, uh, works with an end-to-end -end data solutions provider developing customized software utilizing artificial intelligence, machine learning, and fintech, health data, and agritech spaces. And they have worked with multi-billion dollar companies including Bayer, General Dynamics, CompuWare, Bell, and Macy's. Next, we have Mylene, who's a social impact driven entrepreneur studying management engineering at the University of Waterloo. Currently, she is the CEO of Lumaki Labs, an ed tech startup on a mission to help companies unlock early talent. And prior to Lumaki Labs, she ran an organization geared towards empowering young women in STEM and has been recognized as a woman of inspiration by the Universal Women's Network. Outside of school and work, Mylene enjoys running, painting for her Etsy shop, and playing the ukulele. Um, just some background on Lumaki Labs. It's an ed tech startup on a mission to help organizations unlock early talent. They operate in the employer university collaboration space to help employers and schools manage and scale their early talent programs through automation and engagement. As a team of engineering students at the University of Waterloo, the co-founders have a passion for the future of work. Next up, we have Emily Johnson, who's the founder and creative director of Stronger You Senior Fitness, a globally unique senior fitness education company. She is on a mission to innovate and elevate senior fitness globally by empowering recreation, fitness, and wellness professionals and senior serving organizations to deliver high quality senior fitness classes. Stronger You Senior Fitness empowers recreation activity and wellness professionals working in retirement communities, long-term care homes, and similar settings to deliver high quality senior fitness experiences. It's the first fitness education company globally to offer an online instructor course and 30 minutes of brand new class content monthly in a rotation of four formats with cardio strength, stretch, and balance. And last but not least, we have JD, who is the founder of Zenia Education. So as the vision setter, he Center. He draws on a decade of experience as a service receiver and service provider in the international education industry to move Xenia, its partners, and employees closer to the company's mission every day. Xenia is, Education is the creator of GUIDE, which exists to help international students thrive. It is an international student engagement platform for universities to onboard international students, build community, and support students in one place. It's a home for your international students. 
So with those introductions, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to stop sharing that so we can see everyone. Perfect. So I did just want to kick it off um, and jump into our first question. Um, and I just want to get to know a bit more about why you wanted to run uh, your own business. So I'll start with you, Mylene. Yeah, for sure. So I actually never knew that I wanted to get into entrepreneurship, like in high school and things like that. I had no clue what the term meant or what starting a business really entailed. Uh, it wasn't until I guess I started university uh, that I started to see more problems around me. And so through wanting to solve those problems, that's kind of how I got introduced to how entrepreneurship can be a way to act on those problems and sort of build solutions. So that's, again, what led me to my first venture, Fem and Stem, which was really more of a social enterprise or nonprofit. Uh, and then as I continue to, sorry, the, the lights turned off in this uh, room, but anyways, uh, as I continued to learn more about entrepreneurship through that experience, I started to gain more interest in the tech space. Uh, and with COVID-19 and everything happening in the past year, uh, it was a good opportunity for me to start looking into other problem areas and problem spaces um, with challenges that came about through the pandemic. So that's kind of how Lumaki Labs specifically came to be. Um, just my team and I's interest in getting into the tech space, as well as looking at, you know, problems happening it, with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and with remote work, we decided that we wanted to focus on that because as current students, we're really passionate about the future of work and just trying to make that easier for students as they navigate the remote world of work. Great, thanks, Bethany. Uh, JD, I'll throw it to you next. How did you get started in this business? Well, I, I, uh, I'm not, I'm not great at working in in bigger uh, organizations. Uh, I am a, I'm a questioner. Uh, so when I, when I'm in in different environments, I'm always questioning, you know why are you running your company this way or, or why are you doing things th this way and so uh, for a person like me it, it only makes sense to to go into entrepreneurship as a route now this very specific area that we're in happens to be a, an area that i care about a lot um, i was an international student um, i came here as an international student back in 20, 2011 and uh, struggled with, with what most international students uh, struggle with, uh, but I, I did make some changes to how I uh, took an initiative, got involved in, and all of that. So I spent a lot of my university years helping students um, and helping international students. Actually, I spent more time outside of the classroom than inside the classroom. Uh, and therefore that got me on the path of trying to help international students. And, and so it's a very natural way to go um, in terms of, how do we make sure that international students who come into Canada um, and the United States um, in some cases are set up to thrive here because you're already coming with, um, and this applies to most immigrants, you're already coming with incredible amount of skills and adaptability that is needed in, uh, in Canada in the world of work. Uh, and so how do, we, how do we make sure you're set up to thrive here? Yeah, what you said at the beginning, I think is a really common motivator, just that I didn't want to work for somebody else and you knew you had the experience to kind of make the right calls and what you were looking for. Uh, Sean, I'll throw it to you next. Great. Yeah, thanks, Tashlin. Um, so my name is Sean Doss, and the reason why I got into entrepreneurship, um, great question, and that's something that I've you know, struggled with and students have struggled with as well in my entrepreneurship classes uh, that I've taught. Um, <clears throat> I've started up a couple of different businesses um, in the past, um, you know, worked in academia, I've, I've taught and, um, you know, worked for a number of different companies. And I should clarify that. So the companies that I've worked for in the past have been, you know, blue chips, multi-billion dollar companies. Uh, myself and my partner, between the two of us, we have about 70 years of experience in both academia and technology. So um, a, a couple of things, Mylene, you know, um, your uh, 
your application in ed tech. That's something definitely that is near and dear to my heart, although we don't operate in that space. So we're not direct competition. So that's good too. Um, and, and JD, you know, working with international students, having taught with international students, I really respect that uh, a lot as well. And my sort of path has been similar in that many companies that I did work with, um, like JD, I sometimes it went a bit against the grain and you know relied more on my um if you will my um, my values okay and, and my morals and sometimes that doesn't doesn't uh, bode well with mission statements so um <clears throat> we had been in, in in talks myself and my partner who is in um, the bay area in in the san francisco area we were in talks for a couple of years, COVID hit, and we thought, you know, what a great time to start something new. The world is definitely changing, right? And um, remotely, we have access to really everything. I was teaching online. I was having, conducting business meetings online. And it seemed uh, very, very efficient. And it, it seemed that the trend now is with a lot of people actually quitting their jobs. So the stats say some people having lost them, but others having quit them and trying new things. So this was the time uh, where the world was kind of on this pivot. And I wanted to sort of, you know, pivot it in my life in the direction of, um, of, of independence and exercise a lot of the tools the uh, the skill sets that I had acquired over a, a number of years and actually put them into use, providing solutions uh, for companies that were sometimes dealing with uh, a lot of other tech companies that were a bit more complicated, if you were, and providing solutions that were overpriced, right? And, um, you know, creating a, a lot of red tape and, and difficulty in actually capitalizing on and implementing those solutions. So that is what has really let me, led me to um, start my own business. Great. Thank you, Sean. I think it's been super interesting to see the amount of people that have actually been able to take advantage of the pandemic um, and that remote work availability um, and really start something from scratch and kind of lead with that. Um, I know, Emily, your business has kind of benefited from that remote opportunity. So I'll jump to you lastly. Yes, uh, so very similar to Mylene, it sounds like. I never intended to be an entrepreneur. I had a very specific 10-year plan for my life. And when I got to about year six of that plan, going right on track, um, I saw that there was this incredible need. Um, at the time, I was the regional manager of recreation. I was overseeing 49 retirement communities across Canada, BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario. And I was traveling and all of that came to a halt uh, with COVID-19. And it gave me time to pause and to think about the impact that I could make as an entrepreneur and feeling a need that I saw within my team of 49 as, as well as with the other organizations that I had worked with. So it was really for me about wanting to make the biggest impact possible. And I felt that in my role, I was making some impact and I was, you know, supporting my team, but I could make a, a bigger impact and serve a larger purpose uh, by creating stronger youth senior fitness. Uh, so that's what prompted my uh, entrepreneurial beginnings. Thanks. Um, you've all been uh, kind of hinting at some of the insight uh, you've learned just from your past experience, whether through school or work. Um, but I'm wondering what specific skills um, you've all either developed or come in uh, to this with that you really found been the most beneficial to have as a founder or CEO. Uh, JD, I'll throw it to you first. Number one for me has been uh, adaptability being able to, to um, move through spaces, being able to uh, change course when I need to, and being able to, to dive into the deep end when I need to. Um, and that has been very important for me as somebody who is an outsider in Canada. Um, being, looking at, looking at things and saying, you know what, these spaces weren't made for me, but you know, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump into it and, and take advantage of those. Uh, so for me, adaptability has been critical. 
Uh, Mylene, I'll have you go next. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, this kind of also builds off of what JD said as well, but I think um, more so than a skill, it's more so a mindset or like way of looking at things. I think like even looking back to myself when I first got into entrepreneurship, like two or three years ago now, um, it's crazy to think about how like, you know, you go in and you're super excited and you're just like, yeah, everything's going to go as planned, um, but then it doesn't go as planned. And so I think like having that mindset where you acknowledge that the path that you're going to take is going to be very volatile and there's going to be a lot of changes. And as long as you keep persisting and you keep knowing that like, you know, you're doing this for a reason, um, as long as you have that mindset, I think it's really powerful. And that kind of ties in with the skill of like self-awareness. So being understanding and aware of what you might not know. So I think that's something that's been really important for me, especially as a young person is, I know that I'm still in school and there's like still a lot that I need to learn. But as long as I know where the gaps in my knowledge lie, I can go and ask for help. I can connect with other people and understand um, how I can start to fill some of those gaps. So I would say those are the two, two main things that come to mind. And then also, I guess, time management is also really important. Just understanding what important things you need to focus on today and what less important things, you know, that seem easy that you can do now, but are probably better if you you know, focus on the hard things now and take that other 80% of things and do it later. Yeah, those are really great points. I think it's definitely important to know what you, you don't have to have all the answers going in day one. You can hire staff or you can learn those skills later on. You don't need to know everything. JD, did you want to jump in for that as well? Yeah, just to build on what Mylene said, uh, one of the things, taking from a very recent experience, we, some of the things we've been struggling with in, in our company, and you realize that one of the, the great qualities that you, you can develop um, is being excited about roadblocks. So you hit a roadblock, it's, it's gonna be hard. It's going to, you, you go in knowing that it's gonna be hard. Uh, you hit a roadblock and you're like, oh my God, this is horrible. This is, I'm taking a hit. But that should, you know, developing that capacity to say, you know what, how do I get over this roadblock and be excited by that, right? Um, Honing those skills and, and, and sort of sometimes it's natural, but sometimes it's, you know, looking at the positive end and say, okay, here's a roadblock, here's a big issue. How is that, um, how can I turn that into positive? Why is this roadblock a positive? And that has worked for me in my life. And I can point to so many different, um, different times that has been, that has worked. And sometimes that roadblock is just a change of direction that's sending you to, to what's actually best, uh, the best path for you. So, so honing that is important just to build on what my insight. Yeah, starting a biz business was easy. It probably wouldn't be as fun or exciting. Um, Sean, I'll throw it to you as someone who also teaches in this field. Uh, what are those main skills that are really helpful at the beginning? Um, I would say tenacity, okay, perseverance, resilience to overcome those obstacles, right, that come along the way. Um, and <clears throat> even beyond that, you know, JD touched upon that is creativity, right? When we run into those roadblocks, right, they should simply be perceived as wrinkles that we can iron out. And we can't have that tunnel vision to kind of just you know, have our blinders on, we got to look at the big picture and we got to look at how we can get around um, th those obstacles or jump over them and get to point B. That is really key. And at the same time, sometimes as entrepreneurs, what we do is we take too much on our own shoulders and we feel that, wow, we got to do everything. Uh, when, when somebody points out an, an error or maybe uh, a hindrance, all of a sudden you may take it personally because this is your business, right? So what we need to do as entrepreneurs, I think, is really to look to others as well. And there are so many supports in Windsor and Essex um, and in Canada for entrepreneurs. So we need to continue to, to, to look for those. We need to continue to consult whether they're friends or people um, within our own industry and sometimes um, outside of our own industry to build a community and you know that togetherness where we can share and collaborate and learn from one another. 
Uh, Emily, I want to go to you next. I wonder if there's any skills specifically that you learned from kind of working in the corporate world in your field and then running your own business. Is there anything that's been transferable or is a lot of it kind of brand new? No, definitely a, a lot of it transfers. Um, and even, you know, every single one of the attributes that the fellow panelists have said, you know, tenacity, adaptability, creativity, I, I definitely second every single one of the, the characteristics that they've described and they're all definitely needed. Um, one thing that I would say, or a few things that I would say definitely transfer from the corporate world to entrepreneurship is empathy and interpersonal skills and communication because whether you want to solve a problem or just be in business for yourself, ultimately it's about serving your customer, your clients, filling a need, filling a gap. Um, and so you won't be in business without the people who support your business or your product or, or whatever that might be. Uh, so it's important that even though you may have a passion for something and you may think it's a great idea, uh, you know, you have to validate that market and you have to listen to your customer and you have to serve them 100% of the time. Uh, and so that that's really key is that listening and that asking questions and not just giving the pitch, but find out about your customer first and what their needs are. Yeah, that's really important to know. You might have the coolest idea in the world, but if no one really understands it or wants it, you can't really go very far from there. Um, before we move on, I just want to remind everybody, uh, if you have any questions for our panelists, feel free uh, to throw them in there. Um, I actually, there is one question here specifically for Emily, so I'll throw that to you. Um, you mentioned that you changed your 10-year plan within your sixth year. Uh, when you made that change, were you worried about the outcome or were you confident that you would succeed? Yeah, great question. Um, it's definitely nerve wracking when you're, if you've gone into the corporate world or, you know, a career, a stable income benefits, and you're deciding to leave that all up, you know, sometimes they call it as, you know, breaking the golden handcuffs of uh, leaving the corporate world and going into entrepreneurship. It was definitely scary, I will tell you that, but uh, you, you have to put the right steps in place. So for me, that meant ensuring that financially that I would be okay for a year, if not more, um, so I could continue to reinvest the, the, the company money that was coming in back into the business and not have to uh, use it solely to, to pay a salary. So, so that was really, really important. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely scary, but at that point, I had been running Stronger You for a year and it had it had gone to that tipping point. So I, I feel like for me and hopefully for most entrepreneurs who are, who are thinking about making that decision, um, it's not just, you know, I want to work full time on, on my business, but it makes sense to move to full time on your business and and the need is there for what you've created and, and you're going to be OK. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Um, I want to open up kind of a similar question to our other panelists. Has there been any kind of early obstacle that you've hit that you thought maybe this is the end, you can't push through? Um, and how were you able to resolve that? Uh, Sean, I'll throw to you first. Okay. Yeah, um, early obstacles, I would have to say, though they were very short lived. One was, you know, distance between myself and my partner. Uh, we're on kind of opposing coasts. Uh, and then, of course, funding, right? Um, funding and how to um, do more hiring um, at, with the, the limited income sort of that we had, uh, the limited capital, I should say. Um, so that was an initial obstacle. And what we did was, you know, reach out to um, the community, uh, the supports that are available here in the Windsor and Essex area, um, as well to uh, friends and angel investors. Yeah, that's a really great point of uh, just promoting those services as well. That's yeah, great. one more thing. Sorry. Um, okay. We did. I did leverage my uh, network as well. Um, have been in the area and worked, you know, in, in, in both the US and Canada uh, for a number of years. So that was something that really helped um, overcome many of the obstacles. So if you are, if I can give any advice to anyone that's wanting to start a business, try to leverage a network. If you have one, if you don't, start getting involved in, in the community. For me, uh, I got involved with something called uh, a GDG, Google Developers Group, 
Uh, I've been a lead for that for a few years. We started that in Windsor, Essex. They have a number of different chapters and that really broadened uh, my horizons personally, gave me so many more contacts within um, the tech community as well as the business community. So if you don't have a network, get involved, get out there, talk to people, shake hands and, and talk to them, not just about your business, but more importantly, theirs. And that um, uh, relates to something that Emily said, right? Listening skills, that's really key, right? Talking to people, asking them questions, not simply just, um, you know, giving them your pitch, whether it's an elevator pitch or um, a, a, a elongated explanation of your business. So yeah, uh, my network and getting to know people really helped me overcome any of the obstacles that I've that I've faced. Yeah, that's a really great point um, that I think we're going to touch on again today. Um, I just want to throw it to Mylene uh, to talk about any obstacles you faced. Yeah, so I think the first one that like, I feel like a lot of young people or just people in general experience is like feeling like they're too inexperienced or that they're too young to, to go ahead and start something. Uh, like even myself, like thinking back to high school, um, I always knew I wanted to like do something like, again, I didn't know what entrepreneurship was, but I knew I wanted to have a positive impact in some way. Um, but I always told myself like, oh, I'll do that. Like when I graduate or when I get a full-time job, uh, but I never really considered like, why not now? So I think the biggest early challenge is really just like, again, that mindset piece of, um, you know, taking that leap and allowing yourself to go ahead and pursue ideas and not be worried about failure. Um, so I think like the realization that I had there was that a lot of what I was seeing around me was older people who were um, successful in doing these things. And I didn't really have a lot of those like younger role models. Um, so I kind of decided like, okay, like I, I wanna be that. That's, that's who I wanna be to try to inspire other young people to also do the same. Um, I guess the other challenge that comes to mind and there's, there's a lot, I guess, uh, but just to like sum it up and kind of go into another one more specifically, um, I think like, one thing being a student is time. It can always feel like, you know, you have so much to do with like exams and just studying and school and like balancing social life and, and things like that. And you definitely have to make sacrifices. Um, so I think understanding how much time you actually want to commit to this and like um, how far you want to take your venture is something that is an early challenge, especially if you're working on another team uh, or sorry, on a team of, of people. Um, university or college is a very volatile stage of time. And so you might have co-founders leaving and things like that. And it almost feels sometimes that you're growing up too fast in a way because suddenly you have to um, act more professionally. You have to figure out how legal things work. You need to figure out accounting and taxes and all these things. Uh, and it can be very overwhelming. But I think the biggest thing that I've learned with those things is to just face it head on and to try not to avoid things. Because I went through a period of time where I would avoid the hard things and I would avoid trying to learn about the things that would like take my business to the next level. Um, but by actually facing it head on, having those hard conversations with my team and things like that um, have really helped in overcoming some of those challenges. Yeah, that's a really interesting point of trying to start a business while so young. So you're learning in school and you're learning on your own through this. It's a really interesting point that you really have to have that kind of motivation to go on. Um, JD, I'll throw it to you next. And I think you're gonna tackle uh, one of the questions in the chat as well. Yeah, so I would, I would tackle the question first and then I'll answer your mm -hmm. question. Uh, so the, 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 the question is about, has there ever been a point in time when you, you thought your business would not be successful and not reach its full potential? How'd you overcome, overcome that? Well, the short answer is you never get over that. It, it's even I've met founders who's raised millions of dollars and, and every day you think about whether your business is going to fail or if it's going to reach its full uh, potential. So um, it is embracing that, right? Um, the, the, the first step in your journey as an entrepreneur is to accept that you might fail. It's just the truth of the matter. Um, 90% of entrepreneurs uh, fail at their business. It's, it's, it's a well-known fact. Um, if, you don't, if you don't fail completely, you're gonna fail on something at some point. Uh, so it is embracing the fact that the likelihood of you failing is very, very high. Um, so 
you have to decide whether that is something you um, you want to or you can stomach. That being said, once you embrace that, it's an exciting journey, right? Because you always ask, oh, is this the time that I fail now? Oh, no, okay, let's keep going. <laughs> so, so it becomes an exciting journey. Now, that being said, talking about answering the question about obstacles, uh, I'll bring, I'll bring all, pretty much what everybody said here. So when you, the obstacle that you face and the importance of the ecosystem that you have, as well as listening to your customers. So one of the one of the the the, the one of the issues that we have faced um, as a company and as a founder um, is one of the biggest that any entrepreneurs can face, which is you build a product uh, based on what you've heard from your customers or potential customers because they haven't paid you money yet, and they don't want to buy it. So. <laughs> You say, oh my God, I built this thing and, and uh, maybe a couple of people buy it, but, but not even enough people are buying it to, to get me out there to raise millions of dollars or to get me, get me out there to, to say um, this is a massive company, right? Which is which something you might set out to, to do. So uh, <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir, yeah. Uh, so what I find is, and this is something that we have faced, right? Where it's like, okay, you know, not many people are, are picking up on oh, what, we've, what we, we've, we built. So what do we pivot to? How do we pivot? And this is where ecosystem comes in. Uh, it, ecosystem is important when you're starting, but it's also it's important when you've hit those massive, massive obstacles that could, you know, just take everything sideways. Um, but having that ecosystem to lean on to say, hey, uh, okay, we are making this pivot because maybe something's wrong with our product or our product is not resonating with the market. Um, having people to say, okay, I can reach out to these people and either they support financially uh, in terms of helping with that pivot or advice wise or connecting with the right people to talk to um, or even mental health wise connecting with that network to say, hey, I'm struggling. And I've been lucky in the sense that I've had that as a founder when we, when we reach those obstacles. So building that around you is very important. And then always, even if you, you did it before, always talking to your customers throughout the process. Even when you think you figure it out, always go back to talk to your customers. Or when you hit that roadblock, go back to your customers and say, listen, Maybe we aren't. Maybe we aren't solving the problem that we thought we were solving, right? Tell me again what is your problem, or you know, start listening and talking to your customers. Having that ecosystem uh, uh, is very important in building a successful company and a successful product. And finally, yeah, embrace embrace the fact that you 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 have a very high likelihood of, of failing, and 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 it, and that's fine. Yeah, I think. That last line is kind of the best advice right there. Um, you did hint at some supports and Sean mentioned it before. I'm wondering if any of you um, can talk about some of the supports or service providers that you've accessed um, in Windsor, Essex. And there was a question as well about um, if any of you have reached out to federal, provincial or uh, county grants as a means to start your business. Uh, Emily, I'll throw it to you first. Sure. Uh, so one local organization that I've worked with, with is the Windsor Essex Tech Alliance, so WeTech, uh, and they have just been phenomenal. Uh, so if you are a tech-enabled organization, even if it's kind of low tech, like uh, we are at Stronger You Senior Fitness, we're not the, the techiest in the bunch, uh, they have just been incredible in their support, their mentorship, the resources. Uh, when I first applied to uh, get some of the, the support and the mentorship is what I was looking for when I first applied to be part of their program, but uh, there's just so much more that they've also uh, given us and, and helped our, our business to grow. Um, so that's one that I would say uh, in terms of the programs uh, that are available there, there are so many. 
Um, one thing I would caution is sometimes you can get really caught up in constantly writing and applying for grants and programs and it could almost become like a full-time job <laughs> and you spend all your time like applying and applying oh gotta hit this one gotta get this one and i found i actually got into a cycle of that um, i tried to mostly do it on the weekends that wasn't you know during the the week and taking away from where my focus should be but it did start to leak in and i started to spend a lot of time in this cycle of, of these grants and what i decided to do actually was just push that aside and focus on the core business and connecting with my customers and uh, you know trying different things and that made me much more successful and brought in much more revenue and uh, and money than going after these grant after grant after grant. Um, now, of course, you want a good balance. Uh, the, the programs out there are, are great. Uh, we've used the Canada Summer Jobs uh, Program to bring on students and hire students for the, the summer. I believe that will be coming out in January or February. I think the application is open for that again. Uh, so if you're looking to grow your team and you enjoy working with students and, and mentoring, uh, which we do at Stronger You, uh, then I would definitely recommend that program in, in particular. Great, thanks Emily. I know we have uh, quite a few students in different classes listening today. Um, so that is a really great point that um, even if you're not ready to start your own business, getting a job or an internship co-op with uh, a small business or a new startup can be a really neat way to kind of get mentored um, and kind of get some early experience with that as well. Um, Mylene, I'll throw it to you next to hear about any uh, service providers you've accessed. Yeah, so I think um, echoing Emily, WeTech Alliance has been really, really helpful for us. So um, for those of you who don't know like what WeTech Alliance is, I know Emily already explained a bit of it. Um, they're a regional innovation center. And so uh, there's actually a lot of these throughout uh, Ontario or just, I, I'm pretty sure in Canada in general, um, but specific to, to Windsor, WeTech Alliance has been really great with just like um, operational sort of things. So for example, if we need help with like finding an accountant or if we need help navigating like a new process um, that we want to do for marketing or things like that, um, working with Adam Castle from, uh, from WeTech has been really, really helpful for, for myself and the team. Uh, but I was also part of the Epicenter uh, Venture Woman program last fall, I believe. And that was also a really, really great program in just meeting other female um, entrepreneurs in the in the region and really just building that support system that, that JD was sort of talking about. Um, so I think that was really helpful in that sense. They also did workshops and things like that. Uh, but those were, were two standout things that, that come to mind. Uh, another one that recently I recently saw actually this past summer is called the Bridge Youth uh, 20K Pitch Competition. So there's like competitions and things like that. So if you're a student looking for funding, um, definitely look into programs or uh, pitch competitions geared towards students because there are a lot of those. Um, and then this is more Canada wide, so it isn't necessarily Windsor focused, but uh, there's an organization called the League of Innovators and they specifically run programs for I believe it's entrepreneurs under either 29 or 25. Um, so that's fully remote uh, and it'll actually help you kind of open up your network even more and they run an accelerator program as well as like an early ideation program so definitely check that out as well. Yeah, the pitch competitions is a really great point. And that actually uh, leads me into our next question. How do you guys find the confidence to pitch and start your business and really promote it with those elevator pitches? Uh, JD, I'll throw it to you first. Very tough questions. <laughs> one, uh, one person I would, I would say I've seen um, since the start of her journey, at least on LinkedIn, um, is my name. Um, and I reached out to her, I think it was over a year ago or something like that when I, when I saw. Um, she has been, you know, putting, putting herself out there, attending pitch competitions, doing, doing speaking engagements and things like that. And I don't imagine that it's easy. Um, it is just w be willing to, to, to push yourself out there. And I, and I, and I, I, I do this also, but I wanted to shout out uh, my name. Um, it, you're going to be uncomfortable. So embrace being uncomfortable. Um, I don't think you can ever say, oh my God, uh, I, I really enjoy just being in front of a bunch of people all the time. Uh, you have to, to, to embrace the fact that I'm going to be uncomfortable, but this leads me to 
my goal. If your goal is I want to you know, build a company, building that company, pitching is part of the process. And so if you need to improve your, your pitching skills or your communication skills, take the time to do that. Um, and don't just you know, sit <laughs> and study books. Take the time to, to, to hone your communication skills and then you know, reach out to whoever you need to to, to, to jump in front of them to pitch. Um, I've done pitch, uh, pitch competitions or even pitch to, to people when I know I have no chance of winning, but you just want to practice. You want to get better at it. So, so doing stuff like that would be important. Just, just putting yourself out there. It is, it's, it's, there's no magic bullet to it, um, except the fact that I'm going to be uncomfortable, but I'm going to do it anyways. Yeah, kind of like the worst case is you did more practice. That's exactly. Yeah. Sean, I'll throw it to you to hear what your experience has been like with pitching. Sure. Um, so absolutely practice, right? Practice is, is very helpful when you got an elevator pitch. Um, write it out and say it to yourself in your head. Practice it in the mirror, um, as I'm sure you've heard many other times before. But um, I think what, what JD touched upon as well, and, and Mylene is already out there doing, um, is is get out there and deliver that pitch, whether it's an elevator pitch or a longer pitch, as often as you can, and gauging people's reactions and perfecting it along the way. Yeah, JD, did you want to add to that? Yeah, just to add to that, and somebody somebody told me that uh, this week actually, I met somebody for the first time. He asked me about my story, and I, and I, and I talked. The idea is, especially when you found a company, always be pitching. Whether it is to your mom or to anybody you meet, always be pitching um, your story or your, your company, your startup. Um, you don't know where the opportunity is. When you're talking to somebody who you just meet some random place, you don't know if they have money in their bank account to give you. Or you don't know if they have uh, a connection to connect you with. So everybody is a potential uh, in, hero of your pitch. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So when you meet somebody, pitch. Just, just you know, have that as your as your go to thing, right? Like this is what I do. Uh, this is what we're trying to do, and and this is the, the end goal. This is the vision, right? Um, and just make that a habit. It's something that I myself is learning. Uh, make it a habit to be pitching every time you, you talk to somebody. Yeah, Emily, I'll throw it to you next. Yeah, it's interesting. I've probably done probably close to eight uh, pitch competitions in the last two years. And if I look back to my very first pitch competition and the pitch that was used to the one that just last week that I, that I did, um, it's so interesting how the evolution of that goes and as the other panelists have said you need to practice and refine because uh, if I look back to that first that first pitch uh, you know it makes total sense to you and you get what you're saying to everyone <laughs> but the people on the other side of that pitch hearing you are probably totally confused hopefully they're not but they could be totally confused um, so it is really great to, to pitch you know pitch for, for money for you know the prize whatever um, but also pitch for practice and and to ask for feedback uh, and really take that feedback in and uh, you know don't get defensive and tell them why you did all the things just really listen to that feedback and adapt it because uh, I feel like we probably could have won a few more pitch competitions if uh, if we had been given a little more feedback along the way and, and internalize that feedback a little bit quicker uh, feedback is so important and I feel like that's really important with the, the pitch competitions as well that's a really good point to really, that goes into when you're practicing is uh, how to make improvements along the way. Um, I wanna jump into a bit more of kind of an operational question here. Um, so aside from having a website, what other marketing techniques have you used to market your business and its services such as social media uh, platforms, et cetera? Uh, Sean, I'll throw it to you. Okay, um, yeah, outside of, the web, again, building, you know, my, my own personal network, getting out there and talking to people. 
Um, and social media, we haven't utilized as much outside of LinkedIn. Okay, so LinkedIn has been our predominant force um, as far as marketing, um, social media, and uh, connections. So we, we we try to use that as much as possible. And um, outside of just social media, I've discovered that you know it can't be simply just LinkedIn. There has to be navigators, you know, and other sort of add-ons that you're going to require to search out the uh, the, the customers or potential clients that 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 could be customers. So it's not simply the social media. Um, you need those add-ons that are going to help you. Um, we used to call them spiders back in the day, right? That are going to search um, your social media contacts in addition to everyone else that's on social media to bring back those contacts where you can um, you can just put in, let's say, IT manager, for example, right? And then all of a sudden, you'll get a, uh, a listing of 10,000 IT managers in just um, Eastern Canada, okay? So that sort of thing, that is really paramount. Um, outside of the fact, and, and JD is, is really good at that, um, outside of the fact that you need to constantly be posting. Um, and of course, different businesses require different levels of uh, involvement and, and, and posting, but obviously the ones that get the most feedback are the ones that are not just targeting audiences appropriately, but are posting on a very regular basis. Yeah, that's a good point is um, using your network and kind of finding out how to expand your network um, and using that to your advantage. Eileen, I'll throw it to you next. Yeah, so I would say with marketing, it's really important to understand what is your goal of marketing? Is it to build brand awareness? Is it to get more signups? Uh, or is it just to show expertise essentially? Or maybe it's a combination of all these things. Um, that's kind of how I think that's the first step in understanding what is the most effective marketing technique for your specific target audience. So for example, let's say you want to um, build brand awareness. Um, then maybe you want to focus on posting shareable content or tips or things like that that are relevant to um, your target audience, which, you know, they'll eventually, you know, share in their own networks and kind of have this ripple effect. Or maybe you want to focus on showcasing or building up expertise and showing that you have this thought leadership in this space. Um, then I would say doing things like blogs um, or, po or sorry, posting blogs or um, hosting webinars. I think that's a really good way to sort of build up your audience and showcase that um, you have experience and knowledge in the space that you're working in. Um, or for example, if you're looking to get more signups and things like that, um, there are other tools out there. So for spe specifically um, like tech products and things like that, Product Hunt is really good. Um, so essentially Product Hunt is a platform where you can showcase new technology that you've built or things like that. And people can upvote it, they can share it. You can find um, like beta testers and things like that that way. Um, so leveraging tools like that to further promote your products is also really good if you're looking for um, signups or more leads and things like that. Yeah, great uh, suggestions of some of those technologies. Uh, JD, I'll throw it to you next. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, uh, I'll step back a little bit to, to basics and fundamentals. I happen to have a, a good enough following on TikTok. I'm a personal TikTok account. Um, and I, I work with some, uh, some businesses in terms of thinking about, uh, thinking about marketing and, and strategizing around marketing. Um, and what I'll say is, First thing you have to think about is, what are you trying to do, right? Um, one, you're trying to be, you're trying to reach your clients, right? If you don't reach your clients, you have no business. If you don't have clients, you have no business. And so it is, where if you're thinking about social media tools, where are my clients hanging out? So for my business, my clients aren't on LinkedIn. They aren't on not not on my clients aren't on TikTok. They aren't they are on Facebook, but they're not looking for me on Facebook. They might hang out on LinkedIn, or they might hang out in one of their discussion groups, 
uh, discussion forum kind of things. And so knowing where my customer is, I want to go there. And that's why I want to spend my time. Um, and then the only, the only magic bullet for marketing is test, 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 and test consistently. Um, you, are, you are never there. Just, you know, especially if you're starting up, you have to be willing to just test different things. Don't be tied to an idea. Don't be tied to, to your content. Um, don't be tied to, to whatever you, you, you know, you're putting out. Test and eliminate uh, 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 pragmatic, be pragmatic in elimination, right? Be ruthless, that's the word I'm looking for. Be ruthless in, in your elimination of, of things that's not working. So you may spend, you know, five hours crafting this video that you need to get out there and you have two people watch it and you, you might, oh my God, I'm going to keep posting this stuff like this. No, 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 it's not working. You know, maybe, maybe you want to spend 10, 10 minutes on something that, that, that you want to test faster. So it is testing, testing, testing to see where you, where you land. And then lastly, and this is, this is my belief in the world that we're in right now, when you're thinking about marketing, be thinking about community. How do I build a community of true fans around my company? Otherwise you're trusting your, your customers and your clients to either influencers or to the platform that, that you're using, when usually the platform doesn't matter. The platform is a tool to build that community of true fans around. I think we lost JD, oh no. Hopefully we'll get him uh, back in. Um, for now, I'll keep an eye out, um, but for now, I'll throw to you, Emily, as a company that has a pretty target audience, a pretty niche audience, how are you guys able to market uh, to the masses? Yeah, I'll, I'll just slightly echo what uh, my fellow panelists have said. Uh, LinkedIn is really, really good uh, for the networking aspect um, and also for the posting, just free posting. That's worked really well with our business um, and being in community with, uh, with our specific network. Um, and then for me, it's um, presenting at conferences and, and organization webinars. Um, when you can provide value and education, we're, we're an education company. Uh, so when I do a one hour educational webinar, that's not even to do with Stronger You. Sometimes people will ask, oh, tell us about Stronger You. And I don't have time because it's all educational packed into the one hour, but they see the value that you bring. And even though you've given them such great content for an hour, they realize, okay, if I take this course or this product or whatever you're offering this service, um, you know, there's going to just be even more value in that. Uh, so I would say find a way to create value, whether that's through thought leadership on social media or uh, doing presentations or even just networking, uh, try to try to give a little bit of value. Yeah, that's a good point is you don't always have to be selling, but there's always kind of that way to sell. Um, and we are almost out of time. So I'm just gonna jump to our last question for each of our panelists. And that is, what is the advice that you would give to somebody considering starting their own business? Uh, and thankfully we got JD back on the call. So I'll throw to you first. What is that kind of first step advice you'd give? Sorry, GD, we're not able to hear you. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah. My advice is start. Uh, there's, never, uh, there's never a best time. Uh, so start and then use the networks around you, uh, like the, the ecosystem that's in, that's in Windsor to build that business. That's a great point. Thanks. Uh, I'll throw to Mylene next. 
Yeah, so pretty similar to what JD said. Um, something that I always like to say is don't close doors before they even have the chance to open. Um, I think what I've seen just through a lot of like young people who have been deciding or debating whether or not they want to start a business or whether or not they want to go into entrepreneurship, um, something that I always find is that they have really big ideas or they have really big dreams. And because they seem so far-fetched or far out there, and it seems so far detached from the current skill set they have or the current experience they have, um, they kind of shy away or get scared about actually going out there and doing it. Um, so I think, you know, you can have that big idea, but as long as you're able to break it down into smaller components and actually see, okay, what can I actually do today? Even if it's one small thing, like talking to an entrepreneur who works in this space or, um, you know, getting connected to WeTech Alliance or something like that. Um, just one small step like that really makes a big difference. So don't be too scared if your dreams are so big. Just look at what is the one step that you can do today. Yeah, that really aligns with JD's very simple advice of just start, see what's out there, what's going on. Sean, how about you? Hey, um, I'm going to go academic on you for a little bit. Out of my entrepreneurship classes, what we always tell students is that entrepreneurs do, right? They do things. They, they put a bit of thought into it, but they put more thought uh, into the action and as they're following through with the action. And they let the pieces sort of fall into place and they learn from their mistakes and then they move forward. Rarely, you know, ever really looking back. And that leans on, on, on what Emily's been saying. And I really love the fact that she talks about listening skills. So as entrepreneurs, sometimes we get so caught up in doing, right, in the active process of building that we forget about that listening. So what we need to do is find that balance um, in doing and carrying out our own vision, but at the same time, realize that there's input, valuable input from other folks along the line that are going to be able to support you and guide you and um, help you carry out that vision. And that's a really great point. Uh, and Emily, I'll throw it to you to give that final advice. Yeah, and in my final advice, I just want to speak to some of the questions that have come in uh, to the Q&A because they're all along the same uh, vein. And I think the picture we're all painting is that entrepreneurship is not easy. <laughs> um, it has a lot of ups and downs. So I think for, for some who are listening in today, they're thinking, are you trying to convince me this is a good way to go or are you trying to make me stay away from it? Um, so some of the things that have come in are, you know, do you wish you stayed with your career uh, with being your own boss? outside your comfort zone? Uh, did you have a backup plan? Um, and, and as I've touched on already, I loved my job. I love, you know, not a, a lot of entrepreneurs become an entrepreneur because they hate work in working for someone else. And um, I loved working for someone else. And there was a lot of uh, opportunities that were, were great in that role. But I also love being an entrepreneur, even though there's all the ups and downs. Uh, and what I try to do when we're in that downslope, which, you know, happens is really focus in on the mission and know that it's going to be down for a little while. And that's when that creativity and that tenacity kicks in. And then you're going to be back on that upswing. Um, so you really just do need to, to see it through. Um, it definitely was outside of my comfort zone, starting, uh, you know, my own business and becoming an entrepreneur. Um, and, and then in terms of the backup plan, uh, like I said, work the job, figure out when it makes the most sense to go for it. Uh, for all the students on the line, there's so many great, great programs. I wish I would have gotten to entrepreneurship back when I was a student because there's so many opportunities for students while you're in school to try out being an entrepreneur and, and take on, the, on those supports. Uh, so I would say, you know, maybe don't put all your eggs in one basket right away, continue with the education, you know, continue with a side hustle while you work the, the full time job or the part time job so you can, uh, you can know when it makes total sense to, to jump into that. But uh, definitely don't regret making the decision and uh, continue to enjoy the roller coaster. Thanks, Emily. And I think uh, JD put it perfect in the chat there. It's a beautiful journey. I think that's something that really encompasses all of the advice is you have to start somewhere. You can start small and that's okay, uh, but don't give up. Get support from others uh, that have done this before. Get advice, especially from folks on the line here. Um, so we are just past two. Um, so I'm just going to have it wrap up 
quickly. Um, but thank you to all of our presenters. If we didn't get to any of your questions, they all mentioned they're on LinkedIn. Find them on uh, LinkedIn, connect with them, ask them your questions if you still have some. Um, I did throw um, a quick uh, feedback survey link in the chat and we would really appreciate getting any of your feedback um, on this session and some suggestions for future sessions. Um, but thank you all so much uh, for attending today. If you want to learn more about each of our speakers journeys or more information about entrepreneurship, uh, you can read more at workforcewindsoressex.com slash entrepreneurship dash in dash Windsor Essex or just workforcewindsoressex.com. Um, also, don't forget to check out our next speaker event uh, where we're going to highlight careers in the tourism and hospitality sector, which is going to take place on December 1st. Um, but again, thank you all for attending. Thank you to all of our panelists and have a great afternoon, everyone.